everyone. How's it going? Happy Halloween. I have uh, I have my my Silicon Valley. Oh, I have my Silicon Valley Pied Piper jacket on. Um, you know, uh, Halloween. It's about wearing masks, but uh, in in reality, we're all wearing masks every day of our lives, and um, this is maybe a chance to see the reality uh, under the mask, so to speak. But um, anyway, what I'm really going to talk about today is uh, Coda, which uh, and Coda Boros, which is uh, the proof of stake protocol that we use in Coda. Um, and it's also a, a, you'll learn a little bit about how um, ZK Snarks, which you may have heard of, who knows about Snarks, probably. I see some faces who know about Snarks from yesterday. Um, uh, how they can be used to, to create this, this blockchain with this really uh, strong property of su succinctness. Okay. Um, so just a bit on the goals for the talk. Should I wear it? Okay. All right. Um, goals for the talk. First, we're going to kind of just go over wh why is a succinct blockchain? What is a succinct blockchain? You might think we would do what before why, but actually no. Um, and then how, how can we make consensus work in this setting? Because there are a lot of challenges that uh, are not in the usual setting that, that you'll find in, in this setting. Um, OK, so there is somewhat of a problem with blockchains. And this is really a, a real problem, which is that fully connecting to a network, verifying a blockchain, is extremely costly. And you know the more throughput uh, we, we achieve, I mean, if you really imagine, you know, the systems that exist today are sort of toys. If you really imagine uh, a world where really a, a lot of activity is happening uh, on a blockchain, it, it, no one is going to be able to verify what's going on. Um, if you'd use a traditional blockchain architecture, more and more people will be basically just completely uh, priced out, so to speak, in terms of computational resources. Um, there is sort of like a traditional way out, which is to use a so-called light client. Um, this is essentially giving the consensus nodes control over you know, the light client sort of view um, in, uh, of the state, uh, which on the one hand introduces a lot of friction to using them in practice because you either have to sort of communicate to your user the compromised state of their security or um, you know, do something else. Uh, and on top of that, it's actually, I, I think, quite risky in a way that's First of all, uh, I think real now, but second of all, the more these systems become real, the more uh, lives sort of become bound up with the bits on some particular blockchain, it becomes just even more risky and I think would really be a disaster in, in practice. Um, so let's like, take a, a, a little cartoon uh, look at, at this scenario. Um, let's say you have a blockchain. Uh, let's say it's a proof of stake blockchain. Who knows about proof of stake? Yeah. So proof of stake, I mean, it's called proof of stake, but really a, a more appropriate name, I think, is proof of capital. Because you know, that's, that's what it is. It's not just about stake in the system in terms of you know, uh, how much is my life affected by the system, but how much capital do I own in the system. Um, and you know, in, in a proof of stake blockchain, in a world where everyone's using light clients, say, on their mobiles, uh, what happens is any coalition of the most evil and the most, uh, you know, having the most capital, can determine, uh, can say whatever they want about this, the user's uh, view of the state. So, you know, we have these little demons, these little greedy, greedy people, and and they decide, okay, now uh, this person's uh, this person's view of the state uh, is, I don't know, uh, maybe they look at their phone and they're like, oh, I guess I'm today I'm not a citizen and uh, I have no more money. You know, it seems kind of absurd to talk about because these systems are today toys. But I, I it, it, it could happen. I, I mean, re really, really, this is uh, this could happen. Like, you know, with a traditional banking system, people's accounts get frozen all the time. Uh, it, it, it's not far-fetched to say that it would be really the same scenario uh, w with a blockchain if no one is verifying. And you could say, oh, you know, that's not really a problem because you know we'll just go to like my bitcoinblockhash.com and people who would say that right and we'll just all see like what is the real the real state of the world because someone will be running a full node no okay maybe people haven't thought about this question that much but that's what a lot of people say but the thing is yeah there's my bitcoinblockhash.com 
uh, and, and maybe there's someone out there running a full node keeping up with thousands of transactions per second. But I, I, I can tell you that if a coalition of the, the most powerful people in, this, in the society who control the blockchain determine, you know, this is what the state is going to be, and, and they're all sort of aligned on that, uh, it's going <laughs> to be on news channels and so on, you know, oh, yeah, some independent uh, full node validators, they, they looked at the blockchain, they said everything was fine, there are no, there are no problems here. Uh, please just go to work and, and continue with your life. Um, so, uh, you know, that's sort of a grim vision of reality because in, in some sense, one, one would hope that, oh, the idea of a blockchain is that, you know, we can have sort of this, this consensus, we can sort of encode some norms uh, about how we want the system to work into our system, and then we can trust that uh, by the magic of, you know, incentives or whatever, uh, that those norms will be enforced. What I'm trying to say is that, like, actually, really, that I don't think that would happen if no one is verifying. Um, but uh, th there is an alternative. And what's the alternative? Well, using ZK Snarks, it's possible for even very underpowered devices like mobile phones or, or browsers to perform full validation of, of, of an arbitrarily complicated computation. So. I could run my blockchain at you know bajillions of TPS, whatever, and so long as you certify the the uh, state transition function of that blockchain with a snark, anyone can verify that all of the rules that that we encoded in that state transition function were respected. There was no funny business, um, and and these proofs are are really tiny. They're mere kilobytes, and they're really easy to verify. It just takes milliseconds. So. Um, this, uh, this kind of system where you sort of certify the whole blockchain with a, a CK snark, that's called a succinct blockchain. Succinct is a word which means um, short, I guess, but it sort of acquired this technical usage of uh, short and easy to verify when it comes to proof systems. Um, and this is how Coda works. So Coda uh, is, is a cryptocurrency protocol which implements this idea, um, and, and, and that's how it works. So. Uh, now I'm going to go into a little bit more about what is a succinct blockchain and you know, uh, how do you actually achieve, achieve this, uh, this state of uh, the entire world being verifiable on a mobile or on a browser tab. Um, the answer is it's basically, you, know, you basically sort of um, have to encode your transition function of your blockchain as a little state machine with a constant size state, which represents the, the state of the blockchain. Um, and the upshot for the user is they get a very high level of security. You don't have to worry about this possibility of a coalition of the most powerful rewriting the state in arbitrary ways. Um, and a, a low friction user experience because you don't have to sort of, you know, offer them either this sort of light client experience or, or a full node experience. It's just, you know, they have the blockchain. Um, on the other hand, there, it, it is a serious constraint for the designer of a protocol. Uh, you need to manage consensus while only remembering a very small amount of information. Very often, especially with proof-of-stake protocols, you need to sort of have a lot of look back uh, to understand, you know, what is the longest chain, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but so that's a, a constraint. But you know, we'll see about uh, going about fixing, fixing, or addressing this issue. So, all right, uh, l let me ask again. Snarks. Who has some idea in their head about what it means? It's an English word, but it's also a cryptography word. Um, so, snarks are the following. They are a kind of little, little piece of data which can prove to you the correctness of some computation without you having to run that computation yourself uh, in a very short amount of time. And so a little bit in more you know, formalism or whatever, if you have a program P, an input to that program X, and say some output of that program Y, uh, you can make a proof, which you would call a snark, which, which would convince another person that there's some data there's some data that if you fed it to that program, and also you fed it that input, it would output Y. Moreover, this proof is really tiny, so it's like, you know, I could print it on the slide. It's 100 to 1,000 bytes, I mean, for some systems. And they're extremely easy to check, so in the tens of milliseconds uh, to check. Okay, so that's tens of milliseconds, that's like, you know, a millisecond is a, is a thousandth of a second, so that's a very short amount of time. So, okay. Uh, now. How do these come into the, the, the purview of, of succinct blockchains? Well, OK. Um, we have our, our nodes who are, op, who are operating the blockchain. There you see this node. They have their hand in, in the database. Uh, they're, they're, they're working on their block, um, my first block. Um, and 
you know, there's some rule by which they're supposed to update the blockchain. So while they're doing that, uh, by the way, that rule is a program, right? The rule that says how to update the blockchain, it's a program. I mean, who, who knows that? It's a program, right? What is Bitcoin? It's a program. They're all programs. So that means, uh, you know, we can make, we can sort of snarkify the execution of that program. So as they update the blockchain, they also produce this proof which says, yes, I was quite honest and I, I used a good, a good block and I updated the blockchain in a very honest way. I'm a little angel. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a greedy person. I'm a little angel. Um, and you know, they have that, they have their snark. Now, there is a technique called recursive composition, which works in the following way. So we have this one snark which says, you know, I can, this one says one to two, but let's say I have uh, this one snark that says I can get from state zero to state one. I have this other snark which says I can get from state one to state two. Okay, and we look at them, and, and they both look okay, right? We run our verification procedure, they both look okay. So if we looked at these two proofs, would we be convinced that, you know, you know, we can be in state two, right? That there's a sequence of valid transitions going to state two. Does it make sense? Yeah. So as we said, snarks can certify the execution of any program. Well, verifying a snark, that is itself a, a program. And so we can make a snark of this whole situation, and we can say, yeah, I saw two snarks. Uh, one went from you know, state, state zero to some intermediate state, and then from that same intermediate state to another state, and both of those snarks checked out. And we can make one snark that certifies this entire situation. Um, and because it's a snark, it's still very small. So you know, 100 to 1,000 bytes, it doesn't change in size, it's constant size. And it's still that same constant amount of time to verify. So very cool. Uh, and you know, again, from two to four, and then we just keep going, right? So then we can go all the way from zero to four. So that's how you implement uh, a succinct blockchain using this idea of recursive proof composition, recursive composition of snarks. Um, and now let's revisit this question of what is the alternative? Well, you know, uh, that was the alternative, right? So how, how would this scenario play out in practice where you have some coalition of the most uh, powerful in the society co you know, conspiring to produce some block? Okay, so they, they try and do it. You know, this same demon uh, creates this, this evil red block. This is perhaps the user's uh, screen for a split second, but then you know, a modal pops up and it says, oh, hey, actually, uh, we received an invalid, uh, an invalid uh, state, so we're going to discard it. And you know, they'd have their, 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 their usual view of the world. Or even in an ideal world, uh, maybe uh, you could go even further. So um, now let's talk a little bit about how consensus must work in this succinct setting. Uh, let's talk about proof of work, OK? Everyone knows about proof of work, right, more or less? How does it look like? Well, OK, so in proof of work, uh, you have some state. This is the state that you manage uh, consensus with. What do you keep track of? You keep track of you know, what is the time? Uh, what is the current difficulty, and how uh, weighty is the blockchain? How much work, ha uh, how much hashing has been expended in, in producing this blockchain? Uh, and the update function, you know, it's really similar. Or, sorry, it's really simple. Um, if you, you know, just get used to the syntax, what do you do? You get a block, you get a state. You just, you just like hash that block, you know, shaw the block, check that it's uh, below the difficulty threshold uh, mandated in the state, and then you return. Uh, an, an updated state, the weight is just incremented by whatever the difficulty of the block was, or the, yeah, uh, the difficulty gets adjusted, right, based on uh, some kind of control system, whatever, and uh, you update the time with whatever, timestamp with whatever the block producer said it was. Yeah, it makes enough sense. So proof of work is very succinctifiable. What I mean to say is, if you think about it a little bit, you know, this is a very short talk, so I'm maybe, uh, you know, I can't convince you right now, but if you think about it a little bit, well, you can see that it doesn't, you don't need to maintain very much information at all to sort of update the consensus state, right? It's just three ints, actually. You just need to ma maintain these, this, these three ints. That's it. So what is it that makes proof of work succinctifiable? It's the following. Given a fork, there is a very small amount of data which we can look at to adjudicate the fork, uh, which, you know, a small amount of data which summarizes the chain that we can use to adjudicate the fork. What is that small amount of information? It's just the weight, right? If we look at two forks, we just need to look at the weight, and that's how we adjudicate the fork, right? So that's one thing. The other thing is that the state can be computed, that, that summary can be computed incrementally. We can compute this small amount of state, namely the weight, in an incremental manner, block by block. 
One, uh, yeah, so, th so that's it. Um, the reason that the state needs to be small is because it needs to happen inside of a snark and everything inside of a snark and it needs to be small. Sort of, I mean, there's ways around it, but you know, let me just uh, take that as given. So uh, let's talk about proof of stake for a second because you know, so, some things, some things uh, uh, go wrong here, but uh, in my opinion, the energy consumption of, of proof of work is morally unjustifiable. So uh, our best alternative at the moment is, is proof of stake. And uh, you know, lacking any better alternatives, we'll have to figure out some kind of succinctifiable proof of stake if we want to prevent the scenario where a coalition of the most powerful can rewrite the state arbitrarily. Um, in uh, this presentation and in Coda, we start from the Ouroboros protocol, which is sort of a very bare bones, um, uh, really kind of clean proof of stake protocol. Um, so I, I'm going to say a little bit uh, about, about Ouroboros. Um, and how Ouroboros, sort of the existing Ouroboros genesis works. The idea is the following. You take time, who, like maybe who looked into proof of stake before and who has some idea about it, just so I can get a sense. Eh, yeah, yeah. So you take time, you chop it up into epochs. This is sort of an engineering thing. I mean, it's sort of, in some ways, this is just to keep things manageable. You take time, you discretize it into epochs. So maybe an epoch is a week, okay? Maybe it's a week. Each epoch, you break it up into slots. A slot, that's going to be roughly like your block time. So maybe you make that like 15 seconds or something, OK? Now, the way that it works is you take the blocks uh, you know, in a given epoch, say like, you know, remember last week? We all remember last week. Take the first two thirds of last week, so Monday to, uh, I don't know, midday, um, who knows, mid midday Friday or something. Monday to midday Friday. We take that, and, and somehow we combine all, all the blocks together to obtain s some value, uh, call it eta. And eta is basically just going to be the hash of all those blocks, OK? Th that's basically what it's going to be. That basically the hash, uh, I'm lying a little bit because I only have six minutes, but it's basically going to be like the hash of all, all the blocks uh, in the first two thirds of the epoch. And then what you do is, OK, <laughs> I need to explain one more thing, which is a VRF. A VRF, it's a verifiable random function. So it's a little lottery, a little lottery that you can run on your own in such a way that you can convince people later on uh, about the outcome of the lottery. OK? So it's, a verif it's like a little slot machine that you can play all day long in your uh, staking chamber um, that later you can convince people, yeah, really, I got triple cherries or whatever. So what you do uh, is on, on a given slot, you're like, OK, my time to shine. Like, Let's see, am I, gonna, am I gonna make a block this slot? You just take your VRF, your little slot machine, and you evaluate it uh, you know, on this slot, and you check if it, if it meets some threshold, which is uh, related to your balance, related to the percentage of, of the, the capital in the system which you hold. And you know, uh, if it passes that threshold, then you know, bully for you, you get to make a block. You tell everyone, hey, I made this great block, you should check it out. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. So, that's uh, just some, for some cultural edification, I suppose, because uh, really what we're interested in a little more is chain selection. Um, we want to know how to adjudicate two forks, right? So in proof of work, it's really easy. You just look how much work do these two forks have, and, and that's how you determine, do I believe this is the state of the world, or do I believe this is the state of the world? In Ouroboros, it's a little bit more complicated. Here's how it works. If your two forks forked fewer, then k, k blocks ago. So fewer, me, uh, maybe that should be slots. Few, uh, no, it's blocks. Uh, k is some parameter in the system. I think it's like 2,160. OK, but it's just some parameter. It's, an, it's a number. If they forked you know, recently, so to speak, then choose the longer chain. Just longer, just in terms of number of blocks, longer. Not, w not weightier, not stronger, longer. Otherwise, if they forked you know, further in the past, a l quite a long time ago, then maybe something funny happened. And what you should do is you should look at the point where these two things forked. OK, look, look where they forked. And uh, just look in a recent neighborhood of the fork point. So look, just S, S you can think is not so big. Maybe some hundreds. Look just some hundreds in the neighborhood of the fork point. Uh, and, and choose whichever has more blocks there. And the intuition behind this is, you know, that one of these chains is going to be like a, a, a crappy attacker chain, 
And so uh, the attacker will always not have the most stake. So whenever they fork, there will have been fewer blocks there because they're not going to have the majority of the stake. Maybe over time, the attacker can accumulate enough stake that they're able to overpower the main chain. But at least at, at the time of the fork, they shouldn't be able to do that. That's, that's why this, this sort of makes sense. Now let's think about, is this succinctifiable? Can we stick this inside of a snark? Well, no, not at all. Because they require looking quite a long distance back, say k blocks, which I said is like 2,000, a long time. And the other one, the second rule, requires looking an arbitrary amount of time into the past. So we need to somehow uh, fix this problem. OK, let me not talk about that. There's no time. We have this somewhat difficult problem to address, which is that adjudicating between forks requires looking an arbitrary number of blocks back. But we're succinctifying things, so we can only hold on to a constant size summary. So how do we sort of, how do we sort of uh, you know, uh, resolve this tension? Uh, let me tell you uh, how it works. This is with my colleagues. Uh, instead of doing this forking uh, k bot, this first rule, which requires you to look 2,000 blocks into the past, you just check if they have the same eta value. Remember, this eta is like the hash of the blocks from the two, first two thirds of the previous week. Checking this eta value is totally succinctifiable because it's just sort of the accumulative hash of all the blocks. So that can be sort of iteratively uh, computed, which is a, which is the appropriate thing in our setting. So that's quite good. In that case, you just choose the longer chain. Again, length is something which can be computed incrementally, so no, no, no worries there. Otherwise, you define this metric, which is sort of, uh, you know, don't look too much at the symbols. There's no time. Just think about the following. You just sort of take a min over some, some windows. You take a min density. You look how dense is the chain. You, you take the chain, you break it up into windows, and you see how dense is it. And you just take kind of the min of its density over time. And the thing is, an attacker chain, at some point, an attacker chain is going to be sparse. Because attackers, you know, by some, well, OK. Of course, I gave this example where attackers uh, might control a majority. But uh, the assumption that you know, we uh, uh, tell ourselves, so to speak, is that uh, attackers don't control a majority of the, of the stake. So it should always be sparse for an attacker chain. And then you just choose the, the chain with the bigger, uh, this bigger sort of min value. And that's totally nice and succinctifiable and, and all that. Uh, you know, that, that's, I think I'll end it there. That's really all I, that's all, really all I want to talk about. Um, thank you.